Well, let's begin our time together with prayer. Let's pray. Our God, we do have much to thank you for even this day as we consider another day that you have given us life and breath and all things. We thank you for friendships. We thank you for the wonderful relationships that you give us in this world. You have not left us orphans, but you have put us in a family, a Christian family of your people where we can enjoy one another and encourage one another. But we thank you most of all for that friend who is a friend above all others, who well deserves that name, for he will never leave us nor forsake us. He is a true friend who will deal with us according to our greatest need. And we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ and pray, Lord Jesus, grant us your spirit this morning that we might know your help in understanding your word and in living for you. We plead in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. The Apostle Paul writes in the book of Philippians that we are to fix our minds on those things which are true and honorable and right and pure and lovely. Those things that would have a good reputation. Those things that are excellent and worthy of being praised. We are to fix our minds on these things. Now, most clearly, uh, we will find such things found in the Word of God. The Word of God is true and honorable and pure and lovely and of good report. And there is much worthy of excellent praise to be found there. And the, the truths that we find there in God and in Christ, the salvation provided in Christ. Certainly, those things are prominent in the apostles' minds. But he writes earlier in that same epistle to the Philippians in chapter 3, verse 17, Brethren, join in following my example. Observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. And the reason he says to follow his example, the reason he gives for uh, their doing that, his example and the example of others who walk in a similar way, is because of what also exists in the world. It existed in Paul's day. It exists in our day. In verse 18, he says, Many walk of whom I have often told you and now tell you even weeping that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. They are known to be enemies of the cross of Christ because their end is destruction. Because he knows that because their God is their literally their belly their appetite and whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. And certainly in our society, there are many who would fit into that category of behavior. And so it is appropriate for us as well to take time to look at those that we can follow and observe their lives that have the pattern similar to the Apostle Paul and seek to imitate that pattern. We see that in men who are living and in men who have died. It is my purpose this morning to give a biographical sketch of one such man who is a good pattern, worthy of being imitated, worthy of being followed. Uh, Many of you have probably read much of his writings. I had read many of his books, but had never really known who the man was, what his situation was. And so I want to make him, as it were, a not so much a faceless man anymore, not just a name, but hopefully something more of a person to all of us. And that person is the Bishop J.C. Ryle. Now, I'm going to give you uh, a couple of uh, book recommendations here to start with. This book uh, by... uh, uh, Peter Toon and Michael Smoot is something of, a, of an almost bi- autobiographical biography. He uses a lot of the writings. This is the, this is the book on uh, J.C. Ryle. 
Uh, I got this after I did my preparations for this. I had my, it was on my, one of my wish lists of one of my internet bookstores. Gotta have this book. Well, I got it. There are about probably two of them in the world. I have one. And I had, saw somebody else had it, the other one on their shelf. So when you can't get that one, where do you go? Well, there are two other books that I think are excellent books. This one by J.I. Packer, Faithfulness and Holiness, a witness to J.C. Ryle, or witness of J.C. Ryle. It has the original eight chapters of the Book of Holiness published at the end. The book that we now know as Holiness was originally published by J.C. Ryle in only the first eight chapters. All of the other chapters were added later, posthumously, by those who had uh, ac- access to his records and thought, you know, this would be another good one to add, and they built the book up to what we have today. This book, this is also an excellent book uh, by Eric Russell, The Man of Granite with the Heart of a Child. Wonderful title that truly captures the essence of this man, J.C. Ryle. The Man of Granite with the Heart of a Child, a biography of J.C. Ryle by Eric Russell. And that's published, I believe, by even a Christian focus. So those are the books that, that I've looked at and I've sought to uh, draw from. As we come to address him now, I'm going to take, his, take the approach of looking, first of all, at his life and then his pastoral labors and then some of the specific elements of his beliefs. First of all, his family life. Born John Charles Ryle on 10 May 1816, lived 84 years and one month to the day. He died uh, June 10th in 1900. He was the fourth of six children. He was the eldest son. He was a typical child of the English uh, time. It was a, a Victorian time, a time when gentlemen uh, and gentle ladies were part of the gentry. That does not mean, when you see used gentlemen in their time, that did not mean anything about the way they carried themselves. Many of the gentlemen, we would say, were not very gentlemanly. But it had to do with their status in society. They were of a particular status. They were landowners. They had money. They were well established. That was the gentleman. That was what he was he, he was born into. His father was a gentleman. They lived at the edge of town, lacking very little, had a very luxurious, very comfortable life. He later claimed that he was a good reader, even at the age of four. And that would serve him well, for Bishop Ryle would read very widely later. His most uh, enjoyable childhood memories were going to the beach with the family. This is the kinds of things that you and I would uh, expect or think of. It was not a particularly religious family. His father, John Charles Ryle, uh, went to the Anglican church that was nearest to their home. They were not very uh, committed. They went occasionally to this uh, Anglican church, the established church or state church. His grandfather was somebody that was much more notable. We'll come to him in just a minute. One of the incidents that they point out at the very beginning was his mom, as a child, his mother, like many a mother, gave the son a piece of candy to keep him quiet in in the service. And his the son dropped it. John Charles Ryle dropped the candy. And after searching for it under the pew and being unable to find it, announced out loud so all could hear, I can't find it anywhere. So he's just a very typical child as he was growing up in that Anglican setting. He, as was very common in Victorian times, his wealthy parents sent him away to a preparatory school at the age of eight years old. And that prep school uh, was led by clergy who were often looking for extra funds. That was, again, very typical. But Ryle, from the very beginning, showed himself to be a very hard-working student. This was a character trait that was going to follow him much of his life. In some respects, I would say Bishop Ryle is typical or is exemplary in this way. He wasn't so much somebody who was particularly well-gifted, but he was somebody who was very, very diligent. And as I have told my students at various levels at different times, the 
Diligence will take you far, much farther than gift will. Generally speaking, diligence will take you much farther in life than gift. And Ryle was an example of that. Well, that's his childhood and his, let's look briefly now at his family background. As I mentioned, his grandfather grand, was John Charles Ryle. Uh, so this was kind of a uh, pattern in their family. So uh, I'm going to try to make some differentiations. If it gets a little confusing, I apologize. But his grandfather had a life of magnificent achievement. He was really the man in the family who made all the money. He was a landowner, silk mills, ba- banker, benefactor. And he was a faithful Christian and dedicated Methodist, a personal friend of John Wesley. He died before Bishop Ryle was, or J.C. Ryle was born. And so all he knew of him was what he had heard of him. This was what he heard of him. I only know my grandfather was a very good man and an earnest Christian, an intimate friend of the famous John Wesley, who frequently came to stay at his house and who mentions my grandfather in his journals. My grandmother also died before I was born. I heard that she was a very shrewd, sensible Christian woman. So his grandfather was a dissenter, the late 1800s. His father, or early 1800s, his father went back to the Anglican church as a nominal Christian in the uh, middle 1800s. And then was born John Charles Ryle. His father, unlike his grandfather, uh, was not a very good businessman. His father inherited a sizable fortune, somewhere around 500,000 pounds at that time. And he sought to provide for J.C., we'll call it uh, our young son here. J.C. was a good, providing with a good education at a public school. That's what we would call private school. Now, the names are different in England. The regimen at the college where he went or the school where he went was was reasonable and he was fairly comfortable. Ryle appreciated the help and inspiration he received from his housemaster at and 60 years later still spoke of his first tutor at that school very warmly. He was a man who made a significant impact on Ryle. So, again, just by way of application, don't ever despise what impact you might have as a teacher, Sunday school teacher upon the children. The little impact you might have, the little statement that you might make to a child might be something which will carry them far, far into the future, which they will look back on and remember. So was the case with uh, Bishop Ryle. There was compulsory chapel, and yet at this college, religion was at a low ebb. Here's how he described that time. One sermon the boys never forgot. said most of the sermons were very empty, very vacuous. These Anglican preachers that would come in would, would bring them something that was very, very useless or, or empty, dry. He said, but there was one sermon that they remembered above all other sermons. It was preached by a visiting preacher who was bald. And he uh, began his sermon by announcing his text, Psalm 40 and verse 12. My sins are more than the hairs on my head. Well, that's what made the impact on the child that he went away with. Well, is this guy pretty holy then? Is that what he's saying? Uh, but so you can see that was that was the impact from chapel. His teacher made a far greater impact upon him than the chapel messages because religion was at such a low ebb at that time in the history of the church. He was a good student. He was a good sportsman. He was a tall man. He was over six feet tall. He had a very, they said, stentorious voice. He had an an incredible voice. He was one of these street preacher type guys. Could really be heard above every crowd. He, He despised rowing because rowing was of a vulgar sport. I found great humor in that at our church because we have several who were rowers in their college days. But I found out later that that was because it wasn't actually a college sport yet. It was still something that was done just in society as by vulgar men, by old sailors who didn't uh, uh, wanted sport. They would go out and engage in rowing. He, on the other hand, was much more uh, civilized and, and participated in cricket, the English gentleman's sport. This is who he was as a as a student. There was a time, though, in which he was greatly helped. He was not a Christian at this time, and yet 
he was at a point, one point in his life became very ill. It was just before taking a test for a scholarship to move to the next level. Let's hear it from his own words. A required reading for one of my exams gave me an understanding of Christian doctrine, which I'd never appreciated and l- before and l- looked back on this period of study as one of the most significant in my life. Ryle writes in Knots Untied. It is a simple fact that the beginning of any clear doctrinal views I ever attained myself was reading the articles, that's the 39 articles of the Anglican Church, for the Newcastle Scholarship and attending a lecture at Christ Church Oxford on the articles by a college tutor. I shall always thank God for what I learned then. Before that time, I really knew nothing systematically of Christianity. I knew not what came first or what last. I had a religion without order in my head. What I found myself, I commend to others. Again, uh, an encouragement to us to continue to teach our children the catechism, which gives them an orderly theology. For at an early age, he said, this is what began to set structure to his thinking. And it wasn't just a random set of thoughts. His father eventually became a member of parliament. And so here we have his grandfather, his father, and providing this education, at which time he learned to be a good student. He, he studied, got some order to his theology, and then his father became a member of parliament or an MP. That brings us thirdly in his upbringing in his family life to his conversion, to his conversion. He went to Oxford, one of the notable universities of that time. And uh, his typical day was to get up before dawn. There were two chapels that were given. They had breakfast and there was studies uh, until late in the day. And they said then the evenings were generally spent by most of the students, again, being part of the gentry. Uh, they would spend their evenings going to wine tastings and parties. But Ryle, from that time, just did not have any taste for such things. And so he would stay, usually stay home and read. He excelled both academically and athletically. The school was really an enclave of Anglicanism, but had very little effect on society or in terms of religion upon uh, Bishop Ryle. Now, remember, at this time, Anglicanism... A state church been established for a number number of years since Henry VIII. At this time, the the Catholicism is making another inroad into England, and so they're fighting what's called the Tractarian movement, the Tractarian teaching, emphasizing a return to Catholic practices. And so you have this Anglo-Catholicism coming in at that time. That's what he's hearing in school. Ryle appears, though, not to have shown any interest in this Catholic Catholic revival. As a matter of fact, he showed most of his interest in evangelical preachers, the kinds of men that his grandfather knew, these dissenters and others within the Anglican Church. Those things which led up to his conversion were very typical. There was nothing unusual. It wasn't a lightning storm riding on a horse and going off like Luther did to you know, make a vow that he would serve God. But it started with him going out on a hunting trip with a friend. And while they were out hunting, he was evidently having a bad day with the with the right with his gun, wasn't getting anything. And so he cursed his friend, then rebuked him for cursing. And that began in him a sense of sin and and, and it convicted him. It says from that day on, he never cursed. He never swore again. Though he had had this nominal upbringing both in his home and at school, his grandfather's example still stood before him as one who was a committed Christian. Having been challenged by this friend when they were out hunting, then there was the incident of his study in which he was sick, and actually it happened before that, in which he studied his theology. His sister and a cousin professed conversion under an evangelical minister, And then he got a very serious chest infection just before his final exams at Oxford. It was this time that he began reading his Bible for the first time in his life on any serious level and began to pray. 
as for, for, for the first time in his 14 years of life, he was actually now taking seriously this Bible. In the summer of 1837, he went to a church on that Sunday after the, during this sickness, this time of the sickness. There was a man who was preaching the word. He doesn't remember the sermon. All he remembers is the scripture reading. It was the second scripture reading. Evidently, in the Anglican church had at least two in every service. It was the second scripture reading. And the man who read it paused after every phrase. And he read, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God that no one should boast. And that's what the Lord used to save Bishop Ryle. It says he left the church a new man. Ryle's own words, that verse was like an arrow strung to the bow of the divine archer and its flight was winged in mercy to the heart of the chosen mortal. The Reverend J.W. Diggle, who served under Ryle in Liverpool toward the end of uh, Ryle's life, before being consecrated Bishop of Carlisle, used to impress upon his candidates for ministry that, quote, Bishop Ryle owed his conversion not to a tract, not to a sermon, but to the word of God. Brother, never despise the things which Christ has told us are to make up the worship that we have. The very reading of Scripture can be the means that God can use to bring sinners to life. And from that day forward, he never wavered in his faith, though it cost him dearly. Once being converted to an evangelical minister, he turned down a position as a, as a fellow a teacher at the university because it was so dulling to him. It was such a, a, a dry, empty atmosphere spiritually. He said, I, I don't want to be a part of that. Secondly, it cost him dearly with regard to his own family for evangelicalism began evangelicals, those who held to a true gospel and not uh, a works gospel that was found in Catholicism and oftentimes in Anglicanism. It cost him because it began to be ridiculed among his family members. He would get together and they would pick on it and they would pick on these these untaught ministers and, and whatnot and make a big fuss about it. But this is Ryle's words. Listen to what he how he described this kind of ridicule that took place in his church or in his home. Excuse me. He says it is useful to have our religious principles readily assailed. What is one dearly? is priced highly and clung to firmly. You see, that's why I have a great fear for our churches. Because in many cases, the generation that was, that in which these churches were established were made up of people who had to fight for the truths that we hold dear. They didn't get them from mom and dad. They didn't get them from the we didn't we didn't get them from the atmosphere that we grew up in. There was many that had to fight for them. I have to find this. I cling to the sovereignty of God because I saw it in my Bible and I began to tell people about it and they ridiculed me for it. And they told me that I was, you know, a, a wing nut. And, and but I held to it because it was a religious principle which was assailed. It became very prized. And we have a whole generation growing up that hasn't had to fight for that. Hasn't had to struggle. And they've got parents in their homes telling them, yeah, great, that's exactly the truth. That's exactly who God is. That's exactly how salvation happens. And I'm fearful. I say fearful because I do believe there's true believers in the young people that do love these truths. But I'm fearful that they would be quickly set aside for other things. And we need to beware. Ryle said, yes. I quote again. Yes, because Ryle said, it is useful to have our religious principles readily assailed. What is won dearly is priced highly and clung to firmly. 
right? Ryle then became uh, very much involved with or influenced by many evangelicals. His family moved to the country. Ryle returned to London to study law. He had a recurrence of his chest infection, which hindered his studies and and would again go out uh, oftentimes to the country. He had fond memories of being out there at their country estate. And that's the kind of thing that you and I would think of, uh, probably more along the lines of, if I can dare say this, Pemberley. For any who know uh, Pride and Prejudice, the massive state. That's the kind of place. It wasn't some little hut somewhere. Uh, he would go out there, had many memories, but he became a, com- a communicant member of a Baptist church. Ryle's unqualified acceptance of evangelical religion bitterly disappointed his father, and this led to an estrangement so grievous that he could not confide in his son over even business matters. Young Ryle felt that he was only a tolerated person in his own family. Well, having looked at his family background, at the events leading up to his conversion, his this evangelical influence, this Baptist church in his early life, there then came a very significant event in Ryle's life. It's, it's what he called the darkest time of his life. It was the great trial. He returned uh, one summer, I believe it was, or after his studies, returned to the family home and began working in the family bank. He was just, as again, a tolerated person, so he was given a little job and, and uh, had to deal with various bank notes and whatnot, saw something of the financial state, but, and, had a, and had something of a fear that something was going badly, but his father didn't communicate with him. There was not that communication. He was uh, an eligible bachelor in his early 20s. He was a popular public speaker. Uh, there were many opportunities for him to socialize, of course, in his class, uh, much of which went, which, which to him was very unpleasant. He, he thought very poorly and spoke very, uh, I say vehemently is probably the right word, against, uh, you would have thought he was a fundamentalist, uh, drinking, uh, card playing, uh, and dancing. He didn't like those things. They, didn't, they had no pleasure to him whatsoever. But that's what his whole society was made up of, the strata in which he lived. That's what they did. And so he was very awkward at these things. He did not enjoy himself at them. He was offered a house by his father. He was offered a house and a living of 800 pounds a year if he would find a wife and get married. Get married, I'll give you a house, I'll pay you. (laughs) What a deal, right? But several months after he had returned to the family business, was working with his father, there was a tragedy in the business. His, his father was very easygoing at lending money. He was a banker who liked to give his money away. So he gave out these loans without any security behind them, without any way for people to pay them back. And uh, he eventually went bankrupt. The business failed. Uh, All the assets were lost. All the property was lost. The annual income was lost. Ryle had suspected something was wrong. But he never knew how bad it was until it happened. He had been feeling... Now, I I have to tell you, a lot of the things that I'm reading here are quotes from those books over there. I'm not giving the exact quotes and page numbers. Uh, I'll gladly give you my manuscript if you do that. I'm not plagiarizing. I'm just collating here rather than stopping saying, well, that was Eric Russell, page 30. I'm just going to miss all that. But here's another one of the quotes. He had been feeling that the emphasis on materialism and the disregard of the Sabbath by the family was a complete departure from his grandfather's godly ways and would inevitably lead to a disaster. You see, he, he, he's looking at their spiritual condition. He's saying, this is not good. And he thought that was going to be their downfall. More than 30 years later, the sense of shock and shame from this incident where they lost everything 
was as fresh in his memory as on the day when his father confessed that he was ruined. We got up one summer morning with all the world before us as usual and went to bed that same night completely and entirely ruined. Now, think of this. If you've read any of Ryle, if you've read any of his expository thoughts, if you've read his, his book on holiness or knots untied or practical religion, there's all kinds of illustrations drawn from the banking industry. He used it fairly regularly. Well, you can see where he got those from. There's all kinds of instances addressing the, the, the gentle side of life and luxuries and comfort. Well, he knew what that was. He spoke from what he had experienced and brought the Word of God to base upon that. Used that for illustrations of what the Word of God taught. This was a very unpleasant business winding down the estate. It took about six weeks and they were the six darkest, most miserable weeks of his life. Once an heir of a vast fortune, young Ryle left this hall in August of 1841, humiliated and broken. Having resigned his commission, he was actually at that point uh, hoping to go into the, the uh, royal army. He resigned his commission, sold his horse and had only 200 pounds to his name. He discloses honestly in his memoirs that after that dreadful summer, he experienced days of deep depression, which at times almost drove him to taking his own life. The blackest chapter of my life, he admits. In calmer moments, he was conscious of the hand of God at work in his change of fortune. He was wonderfully sustained in his Christian faith. He says, to feel trouble freely and yet to submit to it patiently is what is required of a Christian was a lesson he learned in that depressing period. An extended quote here from from the book by Russell. He says, I have not the least doubt it was all for the best. In my father's affair, if my father's affairs had prospered and I had never been ruined, my life, of course, would have been very different one. I should have probably gone into the parliament. And it is impossible to say what the effect this might have had upon my soul. I should have formed different connections, moved in entirely different circles. I should never have been a clergyman, never have preached, written a tract or a book. Perhaps I might have been shipwrecked in spiritual in spiritual things. So I do not mean to say at all that I wish it wish it to have been different to what it was. All I mean to say about talking about this is the darkest time of his life is that I was deeply wounded by my reverses, suffered deeply under them and do not think I have recovered in body and mind from the effect of them. So Ryle felt this very, very deeply But he also thought about it very, very spiritually. He took it to heart, the lessons to be learned. It led to a very great redirection of his life. What was he going to do? He now needed money. He was no longer just receiving this money from his family. He didn't have this inheritance to look look upon. He needed a job. Well, he could go to law. He had studied law. But to go to law meant at least two years before he would start making any real money. He thought about becoming a private tutor. He despised going back into that environment of Anglo-Catholicism. So what else was there for him to do? Literally, he says, what else was there for me to do? The only other thing I was qualified for was the holy orders. And so he pursued the ministry, which he was ordained within three months and had a living. Now, we stop and think about that. What? What? This guy's this guy's a preacher and a pastor and then shepherd because Because he couldn't get a job anywhere else. He was just looking for work. He was just looking for money. This was the easiest way to get money. You'd say, what a charlatan. Well, it was a different environment. Remember that. The church and the the state were very much interwoven together at this point in time. And so this was just another avenue of uh, vocation. And so he took this job. I could see nothing before me, he said, but to become a clergyman because that brought some income at once. He relied, as he said, upon sanctified common sense 
I became a clergy because I felt shut up to it and saw no other course open to me. He received an invitation, as I said, was ordained within a few months. His pastoral labors, which began in December 21st in, 19, in, excuse me, in 1841, were primarily in rural settings, which he loved. He was really just a country pastor. He was a country preacher. That's where he thrived from 1841 until 1880 when he went to Liverpool. So for 39 years, he labored as a country pastor in several different congregations. He began by preaching on a regular basis with the style that he had learned at Oxford, which was very florid and very uh, full of long sermons and lots of fancy words. He realized, though, that this was not the kind of style that was best. Listen to how he describes his own change of thought. He says, looking back over his ministry in Winchester, one of these country settings, Ryle felt that he was youthful and inexperienced and was particularly critical of his preaching style. Although his pulpit oratory did draw large congregations, he said, my preaching at Winchester on Sundays consisted entirely of written sermons of a style I should not care to preach now because they were far too florid, far less simple and direct than I afterwards found valuable. Nevertheless, they were thoroughly evangelical and being well composed and read with a great deal of earnestness and fire. I have no doubt they sounded very fine and effective, but I should not wish to preach them now. Later in his ministry, he retained the same biblical content and preached with the same evangelical fervor, but reduced the full written sermon to a few brief notes and preached in a more lucid pithy and forceful style. If you read Ryle, when you read his comments, his expository thoughts, when you read his book on holiness, it's very direct, very simple, very illustrative, very practical. That was Ryle. He came to see that what he really wanted to do was he wanted to do the country folk good. And he wanted to see them embrace the truth and follow the truth rather than give them something that would draw big crowds and make him very, very popular. He did grow and was eventually given a larger uh, country parish in which he was uh, he had a living of 500 pounds a year, which enabled him then to marry. He married a daughter of a notable family. The family was an evangelical family, they were a loyal churchman a supporter of the Protestant Reformation Society and, and held meetings in his home, called in many of these evangelical preachers of the time. And Ryle, then in that setting, under this notable family, was able then to meet a number of the evangelical movers in the day. It was the first time that he actually had serious time for reading. And when he began to read, he began to read good books. Puritans, Owen, Charnock, Sibs. These are the men that he took to himself. And so you see this Puritan theology getting woven into his life. He admired the Puritans for their expository preaching style, though he saw that it was too long and too exaggerated at times. He admired them for their industrial pastoral ministry. He admired them for their sound doctrine. He admired them for their specific and clear applications of the truth. He was then elevated after a short time to a position where he was over 25 of these parishes. And that's when he did most of his writing. This was between 1861 and 1880. He wrote Light from Old Times, which was some biographical lectures, Latimer, Baxter, Whitfield. He wrote Christian Leaders of the Last Century, Whitfield, Wesley, Crimshaw, Romaine, 
Knots Untied was another, probably one of his most famous books at the time, most uh, widely distributed. It dealt with plain statements about disputed points of theology. He wrote at that time, Old Paths, some of the truths which were foundational. His book, Holiness, was written during that time and his book, Practical Religion, as well as Expository Thoughts. He wrote expository thoughts on the Gospels over 16 years. He wrote it for the people in the pew. He wrote it to be read in family worship. That's why he wrote it the way that he did. So it's right for us, brethren, to take that and use that in our family worship. That's what Bishop Ryle wanted it to be used for. And if you read it, you can see how easily it reads. You don't spend a lot of time wrestling with the original language. You don't do a lot. You just get right down to the application. Here's what was said. Here's how you use this. That was Bishop Ryle. He had an overall reputation as a preacher, a publisher, and an evangelical in his pamphlets, and thus led to many, many opportunities to preach. In 1880, to the end of his life, the last uh, 20 years of his life, he was the Bishop of Liverpool. Now, Liverpool was not a bishopric at that time. They made, it an, an, uh, they made it a bishop because Liverpool was exploding in terms of size. They realized they needed somebody to oversee this part of the country. And so he was brought to, to, to be, they made this bishopric and he was brought into that. I believe it killed him, personally, from what I've read of him so far. He was a country preacher who loved walking around, being with his people. He he was engaged in pastoral visitation. He was engaged in preaching. This is what his life was all about. When they put him in the city and made him an administrator over all of these other works, I think they took away from him what was his great heart. Now, he did great work there. He actually saw many, many different parish churches established during that time. I think it more than doubled in the time that he was bishop in, in, in Liverpool, he helped the poor. He spent a good deal of time with orphans and, and establishing orphanages and those who were sick and needy. He, he, he expanded the church's involvement there. He developed a preacher that was an, that preachers who were evangelistic preachers, who were gospel preachers, Christ-centered preachers. That was his focus in working with young men for the ministry. But that time was a very, very trying time. We'll come to that a little bit more later. But that was his basic uh, ministry. Forty years in the rural areas, in the uh, villages, and 20 years in the city of Liverpool. Well, let me just give you something now of the heart of Bishop Ryle's beliefs. The heart of Bishop Ryle's beliefs. We've looked at his life. We've looked at his, his ministry now something of his his beliefs. Ryle was an evangelical churchman. Now, I have to understand what that word evangelical means. We use it sometimes in a, almost a pejorative way now. We speak of the evangelical as the guy who's, who's out there and he's basically Christian, but he's just generic. You wouldn't know what he believes, why he believes it, or and he certainly wouldn't press it on anybody else. He's just an evangelical. And that term is sometimes used that way. But it's used in terms of Bishop Ryle to describe him as somebody who was truly focused upon the gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ, salvation through faith alone in Christ alone. He found that in the 39 articles that were the got some of the governing documents for the Anglican Church. That's where he read it. He studied it and found it in his Bible. And so that's what he preached. He was a thoroughgoing Christ centered preacher and pastor. He denied baptismal regeneration, which the church held from the very start. In writing his knots untied, he sought to write something to help the common people work through some of the current disputes of their day. He was he was disregarded among most of his Anglican uh, bishops and and clerics because he wasn't evangelical. He was looked down upon. He was despised as not being a high churchman. And he was not afraid to speak of his truths. He was a man of granite when it came to truth. And he stood for truth and he made it known what he believed. Here are here's a summary of the basic beliefs of J.C. Ryle. Now, I think any one of us could could write this as some of the basic truths, but 
When I say basic truths, this is where he lived, breathed, and this is what he taught. Constantly came back to these five points. One, the absolute supremacy that the evangelical religion apply assigns to Holy Scripture. The absolute supremacy of Holy Scripture. The man was a man of the book. You've heard it said of, of Bunyan that if you poked him, he, bred, he bled Bibline because he was so full of the Bible. That's what Bishop Ryle was as well. He came back to this book. I was reading Bishop Ryle, reading somebody talking about Bishop Ryle. I thought they were talking about somebody that I know very, very intimately who constantly tells me, you bring your Bible and I'm as as simple as a little child. You can blow me away. But you come to me with your arguments and I am like a man of granite. You will not push me. That's what Ryle was like. You come with your Bible? He was wide open to you. You come with tradition, you come with pragmatism, and he said, I have no heart for it. He was a man of the book. That's where he started. That's where he ended. Absolute supremacy of the Holy Scriptures as the only rule of faith and practice. Second, the second leading feature, Ryle wrote, in evangelical religion is the depth and prominence it assigns to the doctrine of human sinfulness and corruption. When we protest with all our heart against formalism, sacramentalism, and every species of merely external or vicarious Christianity, we are protesting that men don't know their sinfulness enough. For men to be content with formal religion, for men to be content with sacramentalism, for men to be content with merely going to church, Ryle says that's because they don't understand sin. If you haven't read the book Holiness in a recent time, you read it again, you'll see how fearlessly he goes after this issue that we understand sin. He's got a whole article just on sin. And he says, if we would build high, we must first dig deep. Third, he says, the third leading feature of evangelical religion, of Ryle's religion, was this. The paramount importance it attaches to the work and office of our Lord Jesus Christ. In teaching men the Christian religion, we can never dwell too much on Christ himself. We say that life eternal is to know Christ, believe in Christ, abide in Christ, have daily heart communion with Christ by simple personal faith. He was a Christ-centered man. Fourth, supremacy of the Holy Scriptures, the depth and prominence of human sin, The paramount importance of the work and the person and work of Jesus Christ. Fourth, the high place that it assigns, this evangelical religion, assigns to the inward work of the Holy Spirit in the heart of man. There can be no real conversion to God, no new creation in Christ, no new birth of the Spirit where there is nothing felt and experienced within. Again, going after the formalism of his day. Fifth, the importance which is attached to the outward and visible work of the Holy Ghost in the life of man. Now you see the balance. You see, there was there was all this movement at adrift. Well, it's an inward work. And you just let the Spirit do it and you're sanctified. You're holy. It's all done. And Ralph said, no, 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 no. The Spirit must do the work within, but the Spirit must also Work so that there is fruit without. Or there is no true religion. Ryle said, to tell a man he is born of God or regenerated while he is living in carelessness or sin is a dangerous delusion. If you read Holiness again, you'll see that note over and over and over again. But he never left the Church of England because he was a churchman. And for him... The church was important. Apart from the time when he was a Baptist, he went back. He was he was ordained as an Anglican cleric. Remained that until he died. As I've already mentioned, I say I state again in the few minutes that I have left. Looking at his ministerial labors here, this Ryle was an evangelical Christian, but secondly, Ryle was a simple, powerful preacher. 
He loved preaching and was in his element in the pulpit. Ryle was not one of the great preachers of the day, but the rural communities liked the way he addressed them. And here's what marked it. Simplicity, sincerity, and conviction. Simplicity, sincerity, and conviction. First and foremost, he was an evangelist and a Bible expositor. He was a pastor with a concern for men's souls. For those who did not attend his services, he printed his sermons and took it by their houses so that they could have it. Now, remember, he had a parish that was that was not just a church defined area, but that was a an actual area of uh, what's the word I want? Civil boundaries. It was a civil uh, entity. And so he had responsibility for this whole entity. So he would go to the church at the homes of people who wouldn't attend church. And he would give them a copy of his sermon. His manner in his preaching was strong and personal, as was his general demeanor. He was incisive, robust, and forceful in his preaching. He addressed to the heart and conscience of his hearers. He took great care in preparation, made full use of divisions and headings to break up the thought and to concentrate the mind. This, 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 this quote comes from several different books and several places I saw this. Perhaps the most remarkable example of Ryle's love of ordered structure is the address he gave to the Church Congress of Southampton when he received a great ovation from the audience as he concluded his 17th and final point. Can you imagine that? No, 14th. 14th. 15th. It was, but it was, it was clear, it was simple, it was orderly. He didn't just ramble on with his thoughts. He had order to his thoughts. He was dignified, earnest, and used plain, simple English. You don't have problems reading Ryle like you do reading Owen. Right? You pick up Owen, you go, Oh, I know the sentence ends somewhere. You pick up Ryle and you go, Is this guy ever going to stop beating on me? How does he know my heart? It's just right there, right there. He's very simple, very direct, very powerful in his preaching, very illustrative. We must talk to our people when we are out of the church if we would understand how to preach to them when we are in the church. In other words, he was in their huts, in their houses, in their barnyards, and that's where he got his illustrations. This is where they live. Let me talk to them from where they live. And then his final quote to his students that he taught how to preach. He said, and I thought this was appropriate for this morning. Be awake yourself if you want to keep your people awake. And so don't stand up there, you know, half asleep yourself if you're going to keep the people awake. He made much of the Bible, much of sin, much of guilt. Much of the atoning death of Christ and the cross and the power of the resurrection, much of the work of the spirit in conversion and in sanctification, he was constantly preaching Christ. He printed over 200 titles. And they all started from his favorite quill pen. He sold them for one or two pennies a copy. His sermon his tract, Living or Dead, in his lifetime, 26 editions, over 110,000 copies. Do You Pray? 130,000 copies. More than 12,000 of Ryle's tracts were printed altogether and several were translated into, into over a dozen languages. Well, I've run out of time. He was married three times. He outlived all three of his wives he had four children. None of them embraced his evangelical beliefs. One was ordained. They all respected him, whether they believed or not. Well, I shouldn't say none of them did. One of them did. His daughter, Isabel, was a, his Christian daughter. She never married. She stayed with him to, her old age, to his old age, cared for him all throughout his life. 
the deaths were very, very significant. Let me just mention one last thing with, uh, to put his books in place. When you're reading his books, you have to remember he's an evangelical Anglican in England in the last part of the 1800s. You've got to remember that. What did that mean then? That meant that he had several enemies. He had opponents, which he called the broad church. The broad church. These were the liberal theologians coming out of Germany. Did not believe in the inerrancy of Scripture. Believed in human reason over, over faith. Those were some of the people that were infiltrating the societies where he where he where he ministered. There was the high church. That's the Anglicans who were embracing Catholicism or Catholic practices of sacramentalism. That is salvation through the sacraments, ceremonialists, that is all of the extra ceremonies they went through, lighting candles and wearing vestments and doing all of these things. That was also this ritualism. He fought that especially at Liverpool. And the higher life movement, which was begun during his day, the Keswick, often, often pronounced Keswick. It's spelled Keswick, but it's actually Keswick. The Keswick movement was very prominent in those days. Some, the Smiths, uh, what's her name? Purcell Smith? What's her first name? She was very prominent in starting this, this movement. She came from America, went over there uh, to England, had one of these important uh, meetings. That these these uh, conferences began, these Keswick conferences began during that time. Some of their basic beliefs were let go and let God. Ever heard that phrase? That was a Keswick. Ryle despised that. It's not just yield yourself up to God and somehow it'll all happen. It's fight. It's labor. It's strive to be holy. They believed in imputed sanctification. You were sanctified by faith alone. Just believe and you'll be holy. They believed in entire sanctification in this life. That you could actually get to a point where you could be perfectly holy and not sin anymore. So this is the kinds of things. That's what he was actually addressing when he wrote his book, uh, Holiness. So you have something of a sense. Why was he writing this? Why was he so hot about this? Well, this is what was taking place within the church. There was a lot of formalism. There was a lot of apathy within the church. But you have to know this about Ryle. Ryle was a man who was truly and rightly ecumenical. He was a man In some sense, probably unity to a fault. Here was his common statement. Unity in essentials, liberty in non-essentials, charity in all. He was actually criticized by Spurgeon in print for seeking to minister in contexts where other liberal theologians would be working. He went to church congresses where... All these pastors would get together and talk about theology and and wrestle about theology. And he was the evangelical voice in those settings. And Spurgeon thought he was compromising. But he was outspoken in his criticism, yet magnanimous and charitable toward those who differed. Ryle was ready to give support to any movement that deepened spiritual life and encouraged spiritual holiness, but only if it was based on on sound biblical principles. He supported Moody when he came over for his um, uh, revival meetings over in England. And at the same time, he supported Wesley, Whitfield, and other dissenters. And yet at the same time, never gave up on his final truth, the final stand, stand upon the word of God. There was one incident which, toward the close of his life, highlights just how magnanimous he was. There was a man in his, within his authority who was teaching salvation by works within, the, within his bishopric in Liverpool. He fought this man tooth and nail over doctrine. The man eventually was arrested for his false teaching. 
And Bishop Ryle pled for his release. He worked with him. He encouraged him. Though he disagreed with him vehemently his whole life. And this man spoke a eulogy at Bishop Ryle's funeral. Praising the man, not just for allowing him to hold his position, but for being a biblical Christian man. May God help us to stand for truth like granite, but have the heart of a child where we love, trust, and are compassionate toward those around us. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would give us a a greater sense of the kindness that you have shown to us in raising up such men as J.C. Ryle in times past and preserving their books for us to guide and to direct us, to help us to understand the truth and to apply your word to us. And we ask that you would help us, that we would imitate them where they imitate Jesus Christ. And for this, we need your help. And we pray it. Pray for it in Jesus' name. Amen.